you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Those joining us online tonight can tweet using the hashtag MoscowView, which is also located on your program. The forum will begin shortly. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We're really excited to have you all here for another John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum and uh, sponsored by the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs here at Harvard. And this is, I think, a, um, a pretty special forum because we're, uh, unfortunately, I would say, in historic times of a relationship that's uh, in pretty bad shape between Russia and the United States. And this is one of the rare opportunities to hear directly from two gentlemen from Moscow. I know them well. I've known them actually for a number of years when I was in Moscow as the bureau chief for CNN. And uh, you all, I think, have programs so you can read their biographies. They're very, very impressive. They're two of, I'd say, probably the most astute uh, thinkers about the relationship and about uh, Russia's role in the world. So beginning at the end on the left, we're trying to figure out whether there's any political significance to being on the left or the right or the center. So, uh, and I'm wearing red, so that's another symbol. But um, in any case, Sergei Rogoff, who is uh, at the end, Sergei Rogoff is uh, the director of the Institute for USA Canadian Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And he has many other titles. Uh, I would suggest you read it. He has um, ample experience over many years, as does Sergei Karaganov, uh, one of the, uh, I'd, I'd say, one of the most influ influential thinkers right now on specifically the relationship and Putin's thinking, which I hope we can get into. Um, he is the Dean of the School of International Economics and Foreign Affairs at the Higher School of Economics. So welcome, gentlemen. And just a little housekeeping. Um, as most of you know, if you've been here before, we go for about an hour and five to 10 minutes. We have 35 minutes that we chat among ourselves. And then uh, we will throw it open to questions and we'll have microphones and people can uh, ask, ask away. So um, let's begin. You know, we absolutely I think, have to begin with Ukraine. Um, there are many, many questions, but I just wanted to ask, beginning Sergei um, Karaganov, two Sergeys tonight. Uh, Sergei Karaganov, could you tell us what is the end game for President Putin? What is his objective in Ukraine? Everyone here, I think, knows what has happened in Ukraine, but where is this taking us? What is his end game? No, thank you very much. I, I think I, only one person knows that, and that is him. Uh -huh. uh, first, uh, from what I understand, uh, there, there are uh, several options. Uh, one option is, uh, which is, I think, passé, uh, which is to have Ukraine uh, as a kind of a, a uh, ally state uh, with Russia. That was maybe the idea. Uh, now uh, the, there are two other options left. Uh, one is that Ukraine uh, will uh, crack vertically and horizontally. The society will collapse, the country will collapse, and what is being left will be then either divided or run by the very different countries. Uh, or at, at best, uh, we would agree with the Europeans uh, to help them or to impose on them some kind of uh, so solutions helping them, of course, because Ukraine has proven to be unable to survive uh, because of the lack of the state building elite of many other things, uh, impose on them some development, and so it would stay more or less intact as a country. 
Uh, of course, it will then mean a very big political and deep political understanding between us and Europe, uh, with the United States not hindering. At uh, this time, at this time, it looks like I mean you, there are many, 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 many flows in there, uh, but uh, American elite looks so part of the American elite, elite looks looks as if it wants to think uh, to make things worse rather than better. Well, you described. Um, you, you say you're not telling us what Mr. Putin thinks, obviously, but you're describing what you see as a situation. But I still want to make sure I understand what does President Putin want to see there? What is his objective? Because you know the narrative in the United States and some other places, which is, uh, quote, President Putin wants to have um, a, a very weak uh, Eastern Ukraine uh, so weak that ultimately Ukraine itself could never really fully integrate into the West. That's his objective, to, uh, to cripple Ukraine. What uh, that, would you say? Yes, that is happening, I mean, uh, de facto. So there is no need to, uh, to do anything uh, actively. Uh, but uh, the reason, I mean, if we're not talking about Ukraine per se, uh, the main objective of the Russian uh, foreign policy on, on that direction uh, has been for quite a while and is uh, to stop relentless uh, Western expansion of Western institutions, especially of, of NATO, on uh, uh, eastward. Uh, stop the, NATO. Uh, yes, and that that was the original uh, source, main original source, and the reason uh, for the things which are happening in Ukraine. In addition uh, to the fact that, as I've said, uh, Ukraine had had had. Uh, I mean, a bunch of problems of, of her own making her a uh, highly survivable place. Mm -hmm. Sergei Rogov, um, stop. May, maybe for you raise your question and challenge something which you've just said about integration of Ukraine into the Western community. I'm not quite sure that the Western community wants to integrate uh, Ukraine uh, because uh, there are so many problems uh, related to this idea. Uh, besides, uh, Ukraine is a very difficult situation. The, con the country is divided. Uh, the there has been a very bloody civil war. And uh, uh, if uh, you really think uh, that uh, the West is suggesting that Ukraine should become a member of the European Union or the North Atlantic Alliance, I think that's, uh, that's not correct. And as far as the uh, Russian interests in Ukraine, A, we want Ukraine to be a friendly state. B, we want uh, Russian economic interests protected, since economically we are still very much interconnected, even in the present situation. Uh, C, we want our security interests uh, to be protected, since uh, we don't want uh, foreign military bases uh, very close to Russia. Just imagine like uh, Canada joining the European Union or, uh, or uh, some military alliance to which uh, the United States doesn't belong. I presume the United States would, be, would have been very much worried. And see, we want the protection of the <coughs> ethnic uh, Russians, since uh, ethnic Russians make about 20% plus of the population of the country. And uh, I think that it is possible to find a solution. For that, uh, we have to keep the ceasefire. And I want to remind you that it was Putin who six weeks or seven weeks ago uh, launched the ceasefire, stopping the offensive of the rebels who could otherwise uh, have defeated completely the Ukrainian army and move uh, all the way to the Dnieper River. He also made it very clear that uh, Russia is not going to support, support independence of Eastern Ukraine, and uh, the political settlement should be negotiated between Kyiv, on the one hand, and Donetsk and Luhansk, the, the capitals which control the rebels, uh, or the, the regions which the rebels control. Uh, and Russia can help, but Russia uh, uh, apparently has no plans to uh, uh, 
implement in eastern Ukraine what happened in the Crimea. I think it's, it's very important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Sergei Karaganov, you know, uh, Sergei Rogov said the objective, one of Russia's objectives is um, not to have ba bases, meaning NATO bases, close to its borders. But actually, after this conflict, you have NATO probably closer to you than you might want. You have troops, albeit on rotation, but you have a lot more NATO activity uh, in the Baltics and other areas. Granted, you know, Ukraine is not a member of NATO and probably in the foreseeable future will not be, but has this backfired for Russia to have NATO even closer? And well, a more aggressive uh, stance? Uh, the issue on the table was uh, very possible NATO membership, um, NATO membership of Ukraine, which was completely impossible. I mean, impossible causes belly. Uh, causes that was, well, that was, wait, was wait, that causes was, belly? That was, uh, that would have been a cause, could have been a cause of belly. Uh, uh, NATO membership of Ukraine, and uh, uh, we knew uh, that uh, once, uh, for sure, to seven to eight, it was really con not only contemplated but pre-planned. It nearly pre happened. Pre-planned? It nearly happened. It, it, when it did nearly, it nearly happen? It nearly. I will tell the story. If you, however, I mean, it will. Uh, it will. It will. It should have uh, happened uh, because uh, around the Bucharest summit of NATO and mm -hmm. uh, your um, uh, your allies when learned when they learned that they were ambushed. I mean. Revolted, so it didn't happen. Uh, but we knew, we saw that this talk resumed. Uh, so again, about possible NATO membership of Ukraine, that was one of the main reasons why it was all done. As to the NATO activities elsewhere, I mean, I mean, NATO is a uh, is a sovereign alliance. So let them be active. I mean, we are not afraid of NATO. I mean, I mean, flexing its very weak muscles. Mm -hmm. Sergei Rogov, let me ask you, um, there's one, I think if, you, if you're in Washington, I almost said here in this city, which of course for me is Washington, but in that city down there, um, a lot of people are concerned about right now the unpredictability of what Mr. Putin wants, his objectives, where he is going. Now I know in the big world of politics, sometimes it's very useful for a leader or a politician to make it not very clear, to obfuscate a little bit about what his um, ultimate objectives are because then your uh, opponent is caught off guard, doesn't know what you're going to do. But in the real world, doesn't that create at this point um, some instability and concern about what Mr. Putin's going to do next? Um, I hate to do it. Um but I, I, I have to disagree with you again. <laughs> and, you know, I thought well, you were well, disagreeing with Sergei, but anyway. With both of you. <laughs> uh, we, I know Jill for uh, so many years since the days uh, when she was working in Moscow and uh, respect you both as, a, as an expert on Russia and as a journalist. And I'm surprised when you speak about Putin's unpredictability. To my mind, uh, he, he is very predictable. His strategic vision is clear. He wants uh, Russia to be strong. Uh, he wants economic prosperity for Russia. And he wants uh, a Russian uh, position in the international system strengthened. Uh, so strategy is clear. Uh, tactically, mm -hmm. he is capable of doing unexpected things. But my feeling is that um, many unexpected things happened during this crisis. The Ukrainian crisis started about a year ago when uh, the European Union wanted to sign an agreement uh, on association with Ukraine and some other former Soviet republics. And uh, very quickly it became a zero-sum game. It's either one side wins completely or another side wins completely. And uh, when uh, Yanukovych was overthrown and the United States and uh, Europe supported uh, the new government, which uh, uh, legitimacy was questioned by Russia, uh, then, well, you, you, you saw 
tactical unpredictability from Putin in how he responded to this situation. But I want to remind you that uh, when the crisis started, Russia demanded, uh, let's have trilateral negotiations on the economic consequences of Ukrainian association with EU. Uh, I, I mentioned Canada men uh, joining EU, so definitely that uh, would uh, be of concern to the United States. And then the European Union said, no, 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 it's none of your business. Two months ago, they agreed to do it, and we have now trilateral uh, negotiations between uh, European Union, Russia, and uh, Ukraine. And they're discussing uh, hundreds of uh, different economic topics uh, uh, and uh, move forward. Uh, at the time, also, Yanukovych requested that the economic uh, terms, the, the, the economic uh, uh, plan uh, uh, for accession, the economic part, uh, should be, its implementation should be delayed. And again, the European Union said, no, no, no. Now they agreed, and the economic implementation of the association is delayed until 2015. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the European Union and the West uh, did it a year ago, I'm absolutely sure that the, the entire Ukrainian situation uh, would have developed uh, totally differently. And at least there would have been no bloody ethnic civil war. Uh, still, there are serious problems, but uh, uh, I think that Putin uh, makes it, it clear what, uh, what we want the situation to be. Uh, the U.S. government says, well, we shall cut uh, all contacts, uh, cultural, economic, political, military to military, etc., until you return the status, the status quo. And my response is, what do you mean by status quo? Do you want Yanukovych to be back in Kyiv? <laughs> All right. Sergei Karaganov, you know, you're uh, described as the author of the Karaganov Doctrine. I don't know whether you agree with that, but the Karaganov Doctrine, which is basically uh, responsibility to protect. And that would be Putin's, President Putin's responsibility, Russia's responsibility, to protect Russians, ethnic Russians, and Russian speakers, the Satechistiniki, outside of the borders of Russia, and most of them living in former Soviet uh, republics. And I'd, could you explain exactly how far reaching that goes? I mean, does uh, that mean? Uh, there are two problems. There are two problems. One is responsible uh, protecting Russians. I think every country has to do that, but what, what, what means? Uh, I don't think that should be done with military means unless, of course, there is a uh, massacre. But that is a responsibility. Then the responsibility for, for, to protect uh, is basically even written into the UN laws. Right. But However, the the, there, is a, there, is, there, is a, there is a problem, and that is with the Karaganov doctrine. And they, um, uh, still a journalist, in spite, of, in spite of the fact that I dozens of times explained the origin of the doctrine, I mean, uh, uh, use the uh, jerk with this uh, term. Uh, I must say that is uh, one, one of the symbols of this, uh, of this avalanche of lies which we uh, have been uh, poured by uh, on both sides, I must say, we never lied so much. I mean, when we, when many friends were participating in the previous Cold War, I mean, we were more distant. Uh, uh, in 1992, I dropped into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they were lamenting about the, uh, about uh, at a seminar of the minister, um, young, young and experienced, and they, they were lamenting about the, uh, about the uh, fate of the Russians abroad. I said, oh, come on. I mean, uh, they will be our asset, not our, uh, not our liability. They will be Jews of these lands because they will take over. Assets. They will uh, the, be Russia's uh, assets. Russia's, of course, okay. uh, because they will be. They will take over industries. I mean, they will be our allies, and so I mean, we have to support them. But I mean, do not think kind of that like they, a soft power. Uh, yeah, and then of course the minute the the, the, the head of that particular kind of one small country 
Estonia. Um, was approached by one of his apprentices uh, and said, here is this phrase, and this is exactly around that phrase. And uh, the, that person uh, gave a huge speech on uh, Karaganov's doctrine that I'm supporting, I mean, overwhelmingly using Russian might to protect locals, etc. They needed, they need substantiation or rationalization for their statehood, for their policies, for military expen uh, expenditure, I didn't know. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I became famous in these parts of the world. I mean, uh, even uh, Council of Europe debated Karaganov's doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, a few years later, I met this, pres I met this person, this president, and I said, do you know that I respect so much your tiny country that I did not disclose it? It was, I mean, that it, it was almost a joke. Uh, so not to humiliate you. And he embraced me and said, Sergei Alexandrovich, I, I knew your father. You are even, and I greatly respected you. You are even better. <laughs> yeah, but well, let's delve into it a little bit, though, because, and Sergei, please feel free to, to discuss. My, I, the question, though, the focused question, if whether it's to have Russians living ab abroad useful to Russia, influential, et cetera, or it is to protect Russians and Russian speakers who are under attack, being massacred, et cetera. How far does it extend? When does it get tr triggered? You know, do they have to be under physical attack? Or could it just be they don't have legal rights in some post-Soviet uh, spaces, and Russia has the right to, question mark, to use military force to protect those legal rights? Um. Let me remind you that uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed 23 years ago, we had bloody ethnic wars, which were not much covered by CNN. CNN was showing Yugoslavia, but the war in Moldova, mm -hmm. the war in Abkhazia, the war in Ossetia, the war in Karabakh, and the war in Tajikistan uh, uh, are still not uh, much known. And more than 500,000 people died in those conflicts, and 12 uh, million people became refugees. Uh, since the Soviet Union, as a country ruled by the Communist Party, uh, ruled by ideology, was not a nation state. And when the communist regime collapsed, all former communist countries had to deal with the question of new identity. So Poland became the state of Poles, Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and we know well how the, the problem was resolved in, in the former Yugoslavia, if it is resolved. Uh, but for Russia, the situation is extremely difficult uh, to my mind, and we have not yet formulated uh, our response to the question of what is our identity. Is Russia the state of Russians? Uh, is Russia a nation state? Uh, <coughs> Russians, ethnic Russians, make 20% of the Russian population, 80% uh, of the Russian population. 20% uh, are uh, Tartars, Ukrainians, Chechens, Yakuts, and 100 uh, other ethnic groups. So, well, uh, will Russia be their home if Russia is the state of Russians? On the other hand, 20 million of ethnic Russians live today outside of Russia. And Ukraine is only one example. There is a problem with uh, ethnic rights of Russians in Baltic states and in some other places. So, well, uh, is Russia, if, if Russia is the state of Russians, does it mean that uh, Russia uh, has to unite the so-called Russian world? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there, the, the, there is still a debate in Russia uh, about this issue, but I think, well, the idea of the no nation state as a norm, and Zbig Brzezinski usually tells me, why Russia does not become a normal nation state? Uh, I think uh, it will be a disaster for Russia if we become a nation state, because, well, then Russia will, will disintegrate. 
Is the United States a nation state? No, the United, American nation is not based on ethnicity, on greed, on religion, on blood. Uh, while there are nation states, there are many uh, countries which uh, are not nation states. And it doesn't make, for instance, the United States weaker, the fact that you have so many, so, so, so many contribution to this American identity. So, well, I think that what we have had in, in Ukraine with the second round of the ethnic uh, civil war uh, is continuation of this painful process. How well, well we will establish our identity and the outcome of this crisis, I think in, in very many ways uh, will be decisive for, for Russian response to this question. Definitely, we will be sympathetic to uh, fellow Russians uh, living outside. But let's say Russian, ethnic Russians who live in America, they migrated to America. That was their choice uh, for a new country. But many Russians in the former Soviet republics, uh, now independent states, they never migrated. They were born there. That's their land. And unfortunately, the, uh, some of the new independent states and the, the nationalist uh, groups who come to power there, uh, they uh, really uh, are taking measures which uh, suppress linguistic rights, cultural rights of Russian uh, ethnic minority. In Latvia and Estonia, you still have hundreds of thousands of ethnic Russians who are non-citizens. And uh, I think uh, this is a situation which invites, invites trouble. And why Russia is, is, is trying to figure out what is our new identity, I think the leaders of the new states have also to do it. And that covers Ukraine. Because unless the rights of the ethnic Russians there are formalized and protected and the regions are given autonomy, well, the, uh, Scotland has today uh, so much autonomy. Why this autonomy cannot be given to, to Donetsk and to Odessa and to Galicia, to, to other places? <coughs> that would be the movement uh, toward well, finally resolving the question who we are. And unless we resolve, it's very difficult to uh, resolve the question of identity. It's very difficult to us to decide what, is, what are our national interests mm -hmm. if we don't know what is our identity. But Russia has been trying to decide <laughs> what it is as a country for a very long time. I remember in the early days after the uh, end of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the commission that Boris Yeltsin had to define the national idea, and I think that commission fell apart. So I guess it's a, a long lasting. But let, let's get back. I just want to ask a question, uh, Sergei Karajanov. I read a quote um, by you, which was interesting about China. You know, in this whole um, situation with Ukraine, Russia has been saying, well, we can uh, um, get along in spite of sanctions by turning to some of the BRICs for support, you know, Brazil, India, China, et cetera, but especially China. And you said, um, Russia is at last turning economically toward the rising East. It will be a great loss for Russians and other Europeans if this shift is accompanied by political, social, and evil, even cultural estrangement. Now, could you tell me, I mean, is, it sounds as if you are negative in the sense, or perhaps you're talking about leaving Europe and clinging to China, but what do you mean? Is it a bad deal for Russia to be um, moving so quickly and pivoting to China, to quote a phrase, um, because of the danger that China, as a much bigger economy, could simply turn Russia into a source of natural materials? Uh, first of all, I mean, I've been uh, lobbying for, for decades that Russia turns this economically. And only during the last two years, we have started the process of Russians uh, sometimes cheated. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm happy that we are turning because there are new markets. Uh, and we have very many, many, many competitive advantages there. And we are, uh, and, uh, um, we, and we, we could use Siberia and, and Far East as a, 
new source of development for the country and uh, geared towards uh, Asian markets. Uh, China is an um, uh, unbelievable uh, opportunity for Russia uh, because uh, uh, not only for raw materials but for many processed goods depending on how you develop your, your own country and we have not been using this opportunity. Uh, so I'm in a way happy that we are turning but the problem is that uh, the, region, the idea was to, be, to become an Atlantic, Atlantic Pacific power uh, with uh, two bases. And now we're really facing the possibility of estrangement with Europe and with the United States to this extent, which would add to this uh, very necessary <coughs> readjustment and pivot to Asia, a cultural and political one. And that's why I'm concerned. I'm less concerned about becoming a uh, Chinese um, uh, appendix, though there is a problem, uh, of course, uh, then that we will estrange ourselves economically, politically, but especially socially and culturally uh, from Europe, and because Europe is uh, the cradle of, of our civilization. And I'm not sure whether Russia civilization may, uh, will be well off if we severe our ties. And at this juncture, when we're having this kind of a relationship, uh, with Europe and with the United States, uh, I mean, these ties are being severed. All the more that there is a uh, value gap between us and Europeans of a new kind, when uh, Russians like myself and my predecessors mm, were willing to join Europe, were, were, were willing of, uh, to join the Europe of the Gaulle, Adenauer, Brown, I mean, of, of the 60s. And we ended up with uh, joining Europe, which is post-European in many matters. And that is a problem for us, for us because we are a much more conservative society. But it's a complex, so it's extremely complex. But as but to China, but as China, but as to China, yes, there is, a, there is a possibility that we will be overly dependent on China. That's why I would like to have a very robust relationship uh, with economic relationship with Europe, and we shall have it. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, I'm relatively relaxed as of next 10 years because China uh, needs us as much as we need her because of the Chinese strategies uh, count uh, on us uh, in uh, their calculations of inevitable conflict, hopefully not military, with the United States. And they need not now a strategic career, as they were telling us, but strategic uh, base or strategic ally. Hmm. You know, part of the um, next couple of days here, uh, as we discuss Russia, will be how Russia and the United States try to pull this relationship back on track. And I know that this is, uh, you know, a debate everybody is trying to figure out. But realistically, we could, of course, could talk forever. I would say maybe the next five minutes, if we both could look at this, this issue of what are the concrete issues that you see, even in this relationship where two sides are not talking to each other, that they could work together on, let's say, three top issues. So, Gabe? Um, we have different scenarios. One is that uh, the globalization uh, will face a huge divide between the uh, America-led economic coalitions like Transatlantic and Trans-Pacific Partnership, which don't include any BRICS country. And Russia, as a result of sanctions, uh, is uh, moving much closer to, to China economically, but also politically and militarily. And uh, it seems that the United States already is beginning de facto move and I will be happy to hear from my old friends uh, how they, they react to this provocation. The United States is moving to, into dual containment again, not of Iran and Iraq, but of uh, Russia and China. Uh, it's, it's, this movement is not complete, but uh, there are some elements of that. Uh, second point, we should not permit uh, Russian-American relations to be a single-issue relationship. Because uh, in the last uh, six months, all those areas where we have common interests, like non-proliferation, terrorism, Iran, North Korea, uh, climate change, etc., 
all that was pushed uh, into the uh, background and uh, everything is dominated only by uh, the Ukrainian issue. We still have to uh, build our relationship, manage, manage our relationship, recognizing the disagreements, but also uh, without linkage, the so-called linkage of progress in, in one issue to uh, progress in, in non-proliferation or cooperation in, in the fight against the Islamic State, etc. And we should also uh, preserve what remains of the arms control. I mean the INF Treaty and the START Treaty. <coughs> and the INF Treaty is in trouble, and if we don't resolve this issue and INF collapses, then hardly, I think, the new START will survive. And finally, about Ukraine. If the United States uh, can accept Ukraine, which is an independent state, but decentralized or federalized like America. Uh, the United States, uh, the Ukraine, uh, where uh, you have um, uh, different regional arrangements and uh, uh, Ukraine, which is not a NATO member, I think, well, uh, the, the Russia and America can cooperate in creating external positive background for internal a political settlement within uh, Ukraine between uh, the Poroshenko administration and uh, the rebels. But unfortunately, in Ukraine, we see too many tails wagging the dogs because uh, all those field commanders, all those uh, nationalist groups, whether they are Ukrainian and Russians, uh, they, they may be creating more and more trouble, and uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to, Russia and America, have to th agree that Ukraine should not be a zero-sum game, that we have to get a solution where everybody wins. Ukraine wins, Russia wins, and America wins. And Sergei, um, I want to get to questions, Sergei Karaganov. I want to get to questions, but just but what is at the top briefly of your list in the relationship? What could realistically be worked on at this point? Yeah, just uh, take a couple of uh, pills and relax. <laughs> uh, I mean, what are we are doing? Yes, yeah, so yeah, some Valium, yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's exactly uh, my recipe. I don't think there is a shortcut. Uh, obviously, I have, of course, a shortcut. Uh, but uh, it might sound a bit offend, offend, uh, offending if President Obama sends a note to President Putin saying to the, from the defeated professor to the victorious student, because Putin did exactly what the United States has been doing all these years. I think Putin will laugh and we will get back to business. I don't know that that letter is on its way, Sergei. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um, still, just two seconds. Sergei Rogov mentioned the INF Treaty. Uh, that is a dangerous uh, prospect. Uh, I, I, so think, I think that arms control, um, we have in the philosophical uh, disagreement with Sergei, I think that arms control is. He has been an opponent of arms control for <laughs> many decades. For many decades. Uh. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, arms control, and I was extremely bitter opponent, even of the reset because I said that it puts into the center of our relationship uh, a non-important uh, non issue, uh, which puts us again, I mean, uh, as, as potential op opponents, while uh, diverting our attentions from real problems, problems being climate, Ukraine, uh, food, uh, water, ar Arctic, I mean, a lot of a lot of other things which are and were important. Instead of that, we, I mean, concentrated on, on nuclear arms control, which was of interest only to people like Sergei and myself and three others here in the audience, if I remember, <laughs> if I see correctly. Uh, it was, absolutely, I mean, who cares? And also, uh, under no circumstances, uh, under these circumstances, uh, imagine, I mean, we were talking about zero solution lying to each other, I mean, blatantly. 
while I mean modernizing our nuclear forces, I mean like mad. So I mean uh, INF is, uh, could be, uh, if we need INF, uh, in, in intermediate range ballistic, ballistic missiles, we should develop, deploy them. It's, it's not an issue uh, because the the whole body of uh, arms control has been killed uh, by when Americans. Uh, when the previous administration, not this administration, reneged on the ABN Treaty, so yeah. that's it. Well, why does President Putin keep mentioning nuclear weapons and nuclear countries? And it's dangerous, you know, for nuclear armed countries to be, it seems like a, a, a threat. Well, why is he uh, bringing Because he's up wise. He's wise. Why uh, is that wise? Uh, I mean, because he shows, I mean, where uh, uncontrolled conf confrontation could lead to. Hmm. Let's, and that's a good let's remember that despite what uh, Sergei says about arms control being outdated, we still, uh, Russia and America, uh, live in the conditions of mutual assured destruction. We possess more than 95% of all nuclear weapons uh, that exist in this world. And while we cut and cut dramatically, we still, still can kill each other and the rest of the world uh, quite a few times. And m management of uh, this situation, it is extremely difficult. Ideally, we should overcome it and move beyond mutual issue destruction into cooperative relationship. And maybe uh, our failure to do it is one of the reasons uh, of the present crisis, because while well, we declared partnership, but partners don't keep thousands of nuclear warheads ready to be launched uh, against each other. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm critical of the present U.S. position, uh, it's very dangerous, it's very dangerous uh, to proclaim your goal is to isolate and punish a country uh, which is still a nuclear superpower. Russia is not a superpower in economic uh, area, et cetera, but in, in, in the nuclear weapons, we are. And that's why I think, well, we need to save uh, the arms control elements uh, to prevent sliding from what is a cold peace to a new cold war. But if we slide to the new cold war, we would need arms control even more because arms control was developed and formalized by the United States and the Soviet Union to manage uh, the, the cold war many years ago. So, well, I... I respect Sergei's uh, uh, unhappiness with arms control, but uh, I think that uh, uh, maybe well, I, I would prefer to, to uh, negotiate on the American side, not with John Bolton, as <laughs> Sergei does, but with Gary Seymour or Bob Blackwell. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, uh, I'd like to go move to some questions from the audience, and I think we have four microphones. I see one, two, and I think there's one there and one there. So if we have some questions, you can come down to the microphones. And as usual, identifying yourselves and um, making it brief and also making it a question, not a statement. So do we have any questions from the audience starting? Yes, sir. That's with you. Uh, my name is Fuat Hussainov. I'm from Azerbaijan, mid-career MPA program. Uh, could you talk about some uh, economic challenges that m Russia may face in the near future and how it may or may not affect its foreign policy in South Caucasus and Eastern Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, we didn't deal with one of the uh, core problems and for core reasons of this crisis. Uh, for, uh, for about eight years, uh, Russian elite, elites, elites, liberal and liberal, conservative or monetarist, whomever, uh, were unable to produce any kind of a workable economic policy. And I suspect that some people in Moscow, in Russia, decided let's go for a confrontation so we would have uh, a threat and that would, I mean, energize us. By the way, I mean, Russia, uh, through the 1,100 years of its history, have been uh, victorious, mostly victorious history, have been, have been uh, doing well only under pressure. So 
there is a problem. There is an economic aspect to it. Uh, as to uh, possible, uh, so uh, the, uh, the shock, uh, yes, and people like myself are saying that, I mean, the sanctions should stay for a while, uh, even if should? things should. Should, because Russians, uh, Russians should uh, understand, I mean, uh, that the, uh, the economic system which we created by default in the last 25 years uh, is weak, and uh, by, by the way, uh, the sanctions are like a, a, um, a finger from heaven showing us uh, the, the weaknesses of our system, which we have to correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as, to the, uh, as to the Southern Caucasus, uh, frankly speaking, I do not think that uh, there will be any uh, major repercussions as uh, uh, to our policies towards uh, your group of countries. Um, uh, we, we have been having, I mean, more and better and better relationship with all three of them, interestingly enough, simultaneously, which is very, very hard, as it's because of the divisions within your, uh, within your group of countries. Uh, and I must say that we need a stable caucus, and uh, more than ever. Uh, so I think uh, Russian policies there would be uh, if you wish, I mean, more and more constructive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a question over there, please. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a sophomore at the college. I apologize, I've lost my voice a bit, so if you don't understand me, I'll, I'm happy to repeat. I want to ask you a little bit about democ democracy and democratic institutions in Russia. So, by the time President Putin finishes his current term, I believe he will have been president for 15 years total, not continuously. Uh, in 2008, Russia did change its constitution to extend his term limits. And, 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 you know, President Putin having been uh, president for such a long time and extending his term limits so that he can be president for an even longer time in his now third term, see, seems at least to signal that perhaps the Russian government uh, and Russian governmental institutions don't value too much democratic processes and changes in leadership. So I'm wondering, A, do you think that's true? And B, just generally, how important do you think these considerations of voting and democracy are in, in Russian government? Well, it's a very good question, but let me correct something which uh, you said. Well, Russia didn't change its constitution in 2008. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not prepared to, to claim that Russia is a mature democracy. And like uh, with the problem of uh, establishing uh, a new national identity, Building a democracy is something which takes time. Just imagine where the United States were 20 or 25 years after uh, the American Revolution. And the process of democracy building in Russia is going in a zigzag way. Uh, we uh, may expect, at least in my view, that Russia uh, will achieve more progress uh, in democracy building, when we will have a large middle class. Uh, we still have a relatively small middle class in Russia. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the middle class, which was growing as a result of privatization, was almost completely destroyed because of the financial crisis and the default of the Russian government. Uh, Presently, uh, the situation, I think, uh, is not very helpful uh, for the middle class development. And here again, I disagree with my friend Sergei. Uh, the economic sanctions have consequences, including consequences for the Russian budget and some of the social expenditures uh, by the Russian government, like expenditures on health, on education, uh, just next year, health expenditures will be cut by uh, the federal government by 22%. And assistance to small business also is going to be pretty, pretty limited. So, well, uh, I believe that uh, it will take a, a generation or uh, two, and that may be an optimistic assessment, uh, before Russia becomes a mature democracy. I remember how the process uh, went in a zigzag way in the United States. 
It, it took a lot of time uh, before democracy in the United States uh, became what it is now. And even now, it's not ideal. And let me uh, remind you that uh, in France and in Italy, women got voting rights only in 1945 and in 1948. That's the time when I was born. So democracy as we see today in America and in the West is a one generation experience. And we also see how well uh, this experience is challenged by the threat of terrorism. Uh, when many things which were taken for granted uh, 20 years ago have been reversed as a result of uh, terrorist attacks. And I wouldn't mention that political correctness made life for smokers, not only in America, but in Russia, terrible. <laughs> you got a chance the day before, you know, to have a cigarette outside, but. <laughs> I'm counting and the after, minutes. And after. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, excuse me, minutes. We have another question. Yes, sir, uh, yeah. your name? Hi, I'm, I'm Edward, and I'm a MIT graduate student. Um, you've spoken a lot about um, arms control and broader strategic issues, and I'm interested in um, a tactical issue. Of um, We've heard a lot in the past week about Russian um, airplanes and Estonian um, airspace, and then more recently, the allegations that there's been a Russian submarine in Sweden. Do not, from a, from a European standpoint, it seems that Russia is pushing us close to the brink and that something like that can be mistaken oh, yeah. and it blows up into a larger issue. How, or is there another rationale that Europeans and Americans can look at these issues and better understand what's going on here? Well, you hear a lot about it and you read a lot about it, but it's nonsense. What, the submarine Since, or huh? the, or the, the submarines, there is no Russian submarine there. The Swedes didn't find it, and uh, there are claims that it could be a Dutch submarine or somebody else. Right. And as far as a uh, Russian aircraft, look, uh, NATO aircraft is deployed in Baltic states, which is uh, right close to Russia. And uh, Russian aircraft uh, is flying, but it's flying uh, in neutral waters. So when you read that, well, uh, F-16 fighters intercepted uh, Russian heavy bombers near Japan or in the Northern Sea. Uh, that's uh, uh, simply a, a false message because, well, the NATO or Japanese uh, pick up their uh, fighters to follow Russian uh, bombers in the international war, uh, uh, airspace. They don't cross into the airspace of those countries. By the way, we have the same problem with uh, American aircraft and American submarines. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is a reflection uh, of a situation when we are not uh, military allies, we are not military partners. There is a competitive relationship and it's a pretty dangerous relationship. And that's why I think we need arms control, unlike my friend Sergei. Yeah, I must say, but even more, uh, we should uh, stop uh, lying as much as we do. Uh, as I've said, we never lied, even in the worst days of Cold War, so much. I mean, you couldn't you, you couldn't believe your uh, your eyes now. I mean, most of the information you're getting about these things uh, is false. Um, for, I mean, I mean, on, so, which side, so, uh, on mean? both sides, I'm saying. I mean, we are waging. Uh, I mean, we are uh, waging uh, propaganda wars of the worst kinds, and uh, be, because there are more informational societies than when we used to. Uh, we, <laughs> it's simply, uh, I, uh, I do not trust uh, nothing, uh, anything, uh, unless I could check. Uh, uh, this is a very simple case, but I could give you, I mean, dozens on both sides. Mm -hmm. Another question over there. Hi, my name is, uh, is Ruben. I'm a student here at Kennedy School. I would like to ask a question about the shooting of the airplane, MH17. Um, do you think there was any involvement of Russia or of Russian soldiers? And to what extent do you think it served or harmed Russian interest? Uh, yes, I'm referring, I mean, I've just referred, uh, refer, um, uh, referred to the old worst days of the Cold War. In my lifetime, these were, uh, of course, Reagan days. Uh, at that time, if you remember, you don't remember, some, some people will remember, 
I mean, uh, in, uh, a resurrection, a popular resurrection in Poland was boiling, uh, with some support from the United States, but it was, it was natural. And uh, uh, Soviets were near uh, an invasion, very bad, uh, Ukraine. Uh, then, of course, there was a, a similar fight over the pipelines. At that time, it was an uh, oil pipeline in Druzma and, uh, and a gas pipeline. Now we have several fights over there. There are many, many other semblances, and this one is another one. Uh, of course, uh, at that time, uh, an American, some, I don't know for sure, but somebody sent a plane through the uh, space of Russia probably checking uh, their defenses, and it was a plane uh, loaded with people, and it was unfortunately and blatantly taken off by Russian Soviet, pilot, pilot, Soviet. Pi Soviet pilots, yes. Soviet pilots. So this time, we don't know. Uh, uh, this time, <coughs> but we've had an avalanche of accusations on the highest levels. Uh, uh, we, do, we simply, as of yet, do not know, and we know one, one thing, and that is uh, that some of the data is being hidden. Uh, at this juncture, we know only one thing, and that is that it has been hit, taken down. Uh, there are five possibilities. Uh, rebels taking a, uh, a, 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 a Novant to Air mis missile uh, we were, it was a, uh, there was accusation it was a Russian one. Now German intelligence says it was a Ukrainian one. Uh, Ukrainians taking it off there. I mean, some uh, third force because there are private armies there. Uh, so we have all kind of openings. It, it was a tragedy which was used blatantly and uh, I would say immorally uh, just for political means. Uh, that's it. I do not know who, who, who is to be blamed. Uh, one, one, one thing which is for sure, and that is that uh, the impotent Ukrainian government and the irresponsible Ukrainian government could, should, should have uh, closed their space over the, uh, over the territory where there was fighting and where, for sure, a lot of planes were shut down, but these were military planes. Uh, let if we me can keep let it brief because I want to get a couple more questions in. Sorry. Okay, but well, I wanted to say that in, in both cases, uh, uh, in 1983 and uh, this summer, I think it was uh, the tragedy which happened by mistake. Uh, since apparently uh, the uh, Soviets in 1983 thought it was an American spy plane and uh, uh, this summer, uh, again, well, uh, if it were Ukrainian military or if it were the rebels, uh, they were thinking that they are shooting at a military aircraft. And uh, the rebels didn't have uh, the uh, sophisticated long-range air defense missiles, and they, uh, the Ukrainians had. The rebels had a short-range uh, air defense missile since they, uh, had to, they, they were shooting at uh, fighter bombers, which were uh, going at a much lower altitude uh, than the, the 11, 000, 11 kilometers uh, range with the uh, Malaysian airliner. Uh, but uh, it's very strange that the investigation is going in such a strange, uh, in, in such a zigzag way, when uh, now, well, four months uh, after the tragedy, uh, still most of the facts have not been released about this situation. And it said that it will be done only next year. I think that allows all kind of propaganda, propaganda games uh, to, play, to be played around this tragedy. I think we have time for one more question. Two more, okay, one more, thank you. Hello, Chris Jackson. I'm a National Security Fellow here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Question I have ties back to some of the arms agreements that were done with China back in the late 90s that Putin came out and publicly rebuted the reverse engineering that was done by China at the time to gain some additional dominance in defense 
tactics and capabilities. Knowing that and using the American saying of once bitten, twice shy, how are you going forward with the recent partnerships and the arms agreements you're, you're going forth right, right now, with today? Well, well, uh, you were correct. Well, uh, Russia sold uh, to China practically uh, the all of the shelf conventional military technologies. And uh, we, of course, well, our defense industries uh, were unhappy that the Chinese uh, were, were stealing uh, our designs. Well, uh, well, they have a nice habit of stealing high tech from this country and from Russia. Uh, they spend a lot on research and development, and probably in 20 or 30 years, the Chinese will be able to, to develop this most sophisticated uh, technologies themselves. Uh, like 40 years ago, made in Japan was poor quality. Then made in Korea was poor quality. Then made in China was poor quality. It's changing. Uh, made in Russia, it's still. <coughs> Uh, except our strategic technologies. And when I was saying that the United States is pushing Russia to ch into ch Chinese hands, there are some military technologies uh, which Chinese have problems to develop independently, uh, like multiple independent re uh, reentry vehicles for the intercontinental ballistic missiles, like penetrating aids uh, and uh, a few other things. And uh, I really uh, wonder whether anyone in the United States in, in the present administration thinks about the consequences of the decision to impose sanctions on Russia. Since we are denied credits by the West and we are denied access to high tech. Uh, we, are, we will be turning to China. And the Chinese are not known for the Chinese People's Republic is not uh, known as a gr uh, <coughs> great philo philanthropist. They will, are going to, to bargain very hard with us. And I, 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 I think uh, on the American side, uh, policymakers will really start thinking whether you, 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 you need to go into this, what I call dual containment. It still didn't happen with uh, Russia providing China with this kind of technologies. But if it happens, that would be a very serious point uh, in deteriorating relationship between Russia and America. We have time for one short question and a short answer. Yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Mahna Khan and I'm a sophomore at the college. I was wondering, um, you've talked a lot about protecting Russian-speaking minorities in other states. What plans um, is the government planning on implementing and protecting minorities within Russia, especially after the concerns raised by FIFA and Russia holding the World Cup in 2018? You're talking about... Okay, let, 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 let me uh, respond. Well, uh, there are uh, there are ethnic problems, and there are uh, there are there are some racialist groups in Russia, uh, and uh, there are uh, hate mongers in Russia, like in America, or in Europe, or in, uh, in practically all other countries, and there have been some racist <coughs> incidents at the soccer games in Russia. Uh, there have been some other uh, uh, unpleasant uh, events, but I think it's, it's a huge overstatement to believe that uh, in Russia there is no protection for the right of ethnic minorities uh, or racial minorities. Yes, there are crimes committed against them, and uh, law and order is implemented. And let me give you just one example. Uh, some of the Russian ultra-nationalists and Russian and uh, actually raci racist groups have been supporting the rebels in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, they had uh, this uh, Russian ultra-nationalist groups had their branches in Ukraine and they were involved. And uh, uh, just uh, now uh, 
they were planning a, a demonstration in Moscow. And uh, the Moscow government refuses, them, uh, refuses to give them permission for this demonstration because the authorities are concerned that uh, a nationalist uh, demonstration can end in, in some violence and some attacks, etc. So, well, uh, I, I don't deny there is a problem, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure the situation is uh, much better in this country or in, in France or in some other countries. Well, unfortunately, the clock tells me that we have to finish. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, and I, I think it's been very valuable for me, and I hope for our listeners and, and viewers of, uh, who've been watching this, to hear your views. It's, uh, thank you very much, because again, it's a rare opportunity to be speaking with somebody directly from Moscow who can give us a flavor and give us the thinking there. So. Uh, sincere thanks to you, and uh, excellent come back.